everyone, I'm Carolyn from the Lantern of Chagrin Valley Assisted Living community just outside Cleveland, Ohio, and welcome to our weekly edition of Carolyn's Caregiving Connection. This is a program that we offer not only at the Lantern of Chagrin Valley, we also have a program at our Lantern of Madison and our Lantern of Saybrook Assisted Living Communities. So to tune into their programs and learn more about them, or to learn about our communities in general, we invite you to visit our website at www.lanternlifestyle.com. Now, I'd like to talk about our topic for tonight. We've had some great topics in these past few weeks, and from those topics, from those programs, have come some great questions. And several of them have been about the topic of rehab. So tonight we're gonna to learn about what is rehab, what does it entail? What does it mean? And how does it fit into the programming and the services that are typically provided in the assisted living community? So right now this evening, I'd like you to help me welcome my guest. I have a very special guest with us tonight. She is the Rehab Director for Legacy Healthcare Services. And Legacy Healthcare Services provides all the therapy programming here at the Lantern of Chagrin Valley. So welcome, Don. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Well, thank you. So. As I said, we've had some questions in the last few weeks, and one of them is, what is rehab services? I think we probably all have our different uh, interpretations or definitions. Can you help us learn a little bit about that? Absolutely. So at Leg Legacy Healthcare Services provides all the therapy services here at the Lantern of Shrine Valley on an outpatient basis. We have PT, uh, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about assisted living communities, do most of them offer rehab as we do with our own therapy department in-house? No, I think we're a little unique because we are actually um, on grounds. So a lot of assisted living, independent living, they tend to sometimes go home health. Um, so no, we're right here. We, we have an office and we can go right out to the community. We can be in their apartments. We can go outside with them. Uh, we can go on community events when we're allowed to do that. So that's one of the things that does make us a little unique. And that's a terrific benefit because for those of you who have been to our campus, you know how beautiful it is. We have four enclosed courtyards. Of course, the inside grounds are fantastic. And here in the building, we have something called Main Street with lots of little shops and offices. And our therapy department is located there. And that, that whole corridor of Main Street is available then. Yep, and we make use of the whole building. We go into the theater. Um, obviously, we have to follow the COVID restrictions right now, but we use the courtyards. We really have picked up on some of the slack for socialization since the families haven't been able to come in. So yeah, we try to really utilize the whole building and especially their apartments. Mm -hmm. Their neighborhoods make sure, especially when they first move in, that they're familiar, they get to know their way around, they get to know their neighbors, where to ask for help if they need it, where the nurses are, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. So we try to really, rarely do you see us in our department. Mm -hmm. We're out in the community. And I think one of the things that's so beneficial about assisted living is that the residents who choose to come here, they really begin to make their own friendships and relationships, not just with other residents, but with the staff. I mean, we all have close relationships. Yep. And especially over the last couple months, I think we've really developed quite a bond between the staff members and our residents. Mm -hmm. And I think when the residents uh, can interact with us, but also then develop relationships, they respond well to that. I'll call it nurturing, but even just encouragement. You're doing well today. Dice job. I can yeah. see you're trying. Yep. And they know that they have, you know, the families can't come in right now, but they know they have us. Absolutely. Well, now tell me, what kinds of diagnoses would we see related to having a need for physical therapy? Well, in this setting, we, um, our physical therapy is a little bit um, different than the, maybe what you're going to see in a short-term rehab or a typical long-term care. They are really educated. Um, my company is very big on education, and the PTs here are really educated on um, dementia interventions and how to make that work. Because just because somebody can walk doesn't mean they can do it safely, doesn't mean that they can get around their apartment. So they really are geared towards how am I going to make this work with somebody that has a dementia component. Mm -hmm. And of for course, falls risk is a big concern for everyone yeah. in that particular age group. And I think with physical therapy, one of the things I uh, take into note is that with our new bounce back program here at the Lantern of Chagrin Valley, 
we're targeting those people who've been living alone in the community and maybe their world, if you will, is just their living room and kitchen or their little living room and bedroom. It's not their whole house anymore. So yeah. their ability to have strides and, and really walk, if you will, and yeah. go for a walk is very different. And they really have to, some of the tests that you're gonna see like this, uh, sit the stand, the six minute walk test, those sort of things are really modified towards somebody that um, may be cognitively impaired. So our PTs here are really educated on how to make that work for them too. So we can show where they were at when we picked them up, where they're at midway through therapy and then where they're at when they come off of therapy and how they've benefited um, through, our, through our services. Mm -hmm. So we can still use a lot of the standardized tests. We just have to kind of modify it to meet our clients' needs. Mm -hmm. And we certainly have people that have had recovery from fractured hips. Maybe they've so, had a fall. Yeah. And they could have had a stroke or something in years past, even you know, well before they came here. So therapy is the ability that we can even do an assessment and, and yep. know that if they need it, it's right here in their backyard. Exactly. That's yep. wonderful. So uh, when we're thinking about physical therapy, though, also I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the folks who are able then to renew uh, abilities that maybe they have lost, and it helps them. Also, I think um, sleep better, not have as much, you know, the people that say, oh, my legs always hurt, my, everything hurts all the time, and they attribute it to just old age, if you will. Exactly. It could be lack of use. Yeah. And we never go with, well, it's an age thing. Mm -hmm. we, um, we always go with what they can do and try to build on that. And, uh, Kathleen, our PT, is very good with the pain management, and mm -hmm. she's very sensitive to that, so she knows how to intervene. Um, but we never use age as an excuse to, mm -hmm. to allow for pain or immobility. Mm -hmm. And those of you who follow us our follow our Facebook page, you will see that we've been posting about centenarians and all that they can do in lifestyle choices to help them get to 100 and over. And we certainly have a number of people living here in our own community who are over 100 yep. right here at the Lantern. Yes. So tell me, what kind of um, uh, things are coming into occupational therapy? Sometimes I think people think, oh, is that like uh, had a work accident or something like that? No, I get a lot of um, guys that are saying, I'm retired, I don't need a job, but I'm an occupational therapy assistant, um, and this setting is kind of an occupational therapy dream come true, so we can get in there and do ADL, so we are a firm believer in med better living through occupation, so we, for me, it's we do a lot of continence management, we do a lot of dressing, showering, brushing teeth, not only because that keeps them functional physically, but it helps us um, mentally and emotionally to, to, for our well-being. Just taking care of ourselves, like just help somebody brush their teeth and she just said, I feel so much better. Mm -hmm. So just this simple act of brushing somebody's teeth is gonna help them feel better both physically and emotionally. Mm -hmm. She did it while she was standing, so we got some leg exercise in. So this is just um, being able to work in their apartment in their environment is really is an OT. Mm -hmm. Dream come true. We do some kind of stuff we help with, you know, safety education uh, as far as carryover we come up with interventions as far as like how are we going to remind them to use that call light how are we going to remind them to use their assistive device how are we going to remind them to ask for help those sort of things so it's just a it's a real challenge trying to figure out what works for each individual mm -hmm. and that's what's really important in my department is making sure that we are treating the individual not the illness mm -hmm. we're treating the individual right and I think one of the things I've noticed since coming here is that very thing that you're very focused on individual personalities and their needs and their strengths and the goals that they have individually as well exactly. as their family goals to get them back to that highest level of independence. Yeah. So, and especially with ADLs, which are, of course, activities of daily living. Uh, we have a studio right here that is on Main Street that folks can use. And it's really almost looks like a game center. It's got yeah. all kinds of fun things to do either for the resident, their family members, and especially the young ones that come to visit, they can be involved. And it's a great way to yeah. kind of enhance our gross and fine motor skills because when, as you said, when you can't really uh, brush your teeth any longer, comb your hair, yeah. do those grooming uh, kinds of tasks that we all do every day and kind of take for granted, it can be a setback. Yep. And we also have like a little basketball court that we can use. So um, it really is just a phenomenal Mm -hmm. setup that we have here as far as from a therapeutic standpoint there's very little that we we can't use mm -hmm. we, if we need to work on fine motor control we've got plenty of um, options and tools for that 
it's just it's, we've got plenty of room to move and we really can customize it to the individual and figuring out what's important to them mm -hmm. because something that may be important to me what I think should be important to them may not be important mm -hmm. to them so I, we try to figure out what what is important for them and I have one lady that just brushing her teeth is really important to her right now mm -hmm. she's not really as interested in getting up and walking or anything she wants to be able to brush her hair and brush her teeth mm -hmm. so those are, those are the strengths we're trying to build on well, I noticed when I'm visiting some of the residents here, sometimes they'll be practicing little exercises that they've learned in therapy. So maybe they're not in a therapy session, they're watching television, but they're marching their legs yep. or they're doing Ankles. some kicks or whatever it may be that you've instructed them about. So they've integrated it into their day. So it's not like I went to therapy and did it and then I never did it again until exactly. the next therapy. It's part of my day now. Yep. That's wonderful. Now tell me, what is speech therapy, and, and who can who can utilize that? Who would that benefit? Well, in this setting, we um, Fran, our speech therapist, she's certainly um, well. She likes a speech language pathologist. Mm -hmm. um, she's an SLP. She she definitely addresses swallowing and those sort of things. But she does a lot of cognitive. She's the one that goes in and makes sure that they can sequence. Um, coming up with uh, interventions to recall the education that's been provided by PT and OT. Mm -hmm. um, so she she does a lot of orientation, a lot of calendars. She points out the calendars throughout the facility. So she does a lot of cognitive. She kind of is reinforcing the stuff that they're learning, mm -hmm. physical therapy and occupational therapy. Well, and I know particularly with dementia, word finding and yep. the loss of the ability to find the word, speak the word to the item you're referencing, that's very frustrating. You, know, you can't quite do that. And she, Fran is the one, she implements um, most often the Allen Cognitive Level testing, and that kind of gives us an idea of what, where they're at and what they're going to be able to re recall and what, we're gonna, what strikes we can build on. So she really um, has put a lot of effort into educating herself about the different types of dementia and what we can do to help continue to, to maintain what they have mm -hmm. and to build on what they have. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Now tell me, what kind of training would your staff members typically have? Well, before we even get a license, we have a certain amount of schooling we have to go to. For an assistant, I had to go to two years mm -hmm. um, of schooling, and then I had to sit for my state for my state license, and I, had to, I also certified, we have a certification for it, excuse me. Um, now for OT, that's like I implement the treatments and then I have an OT that comes in, she sets up the treatment, she sets up the um, plan of care. Mm -hmm. She is required now to have a master's degree. Some OTs you'll find with a doctorate. Mm -hmm. Most of those folks are gonna be in the clinical setting mm -hmm. or in the educational field or in mm -hmm. research. PT, um, Kathleen, I believe, has a bachelor's. Mm -hmm. She might have a master's. I can't remember, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to get your license for a physical therapist, you have to have a doctorate. Mm -hmm. So those folks um, have extensive education, as does the OTs. Um, now, there are physical therapy assistants, and the same thing. It's an mm -hmm. associate's degree. It's a two-year degree. Mm -hmm. So it's just like here with our nursing staff. We have different levels yep. of education and training and also experience, but together, that integration creates a fantastic team. It does. Well, fortunately, it's really a lot of it is learned on the job. We're mm -hmm. given that opportunity. Legacy Healthcare Services really stresses education, so we get a lot of opportunities to do CEUs, which are continuing education credits, which we have to have in order to maintain our license anyways. Um, so anytime that we have an issue or we feel like we're lacking in something, we have somebody that's, her name's Danielle, that's all she specializes mm -hmm. in is figuring out how to give us the education that we need. So Legacy Healthcare Services is very supportive in education, especially with dementia and, um, and Parkinson's. So we're really supported in, in being provided all this that we need in order to meet our residents' needs. And those are two diagnoses that are very big right now in this age group, if you will, yep. population. So anything that you're learning in your training and educational programs and on the job is only advancing all that everyone can learn. Yeah, Am exactly. Yes, and we learn together. So tell me, how does Medicare insurance come into play with therapy here in an assisted living? It's not a hospital, but does, right. does insurance still come into play? It does. So we're outpatient clinic, um, so we are covered under Medicare Part B and then a secondary. Some folks don't have a secondary, they just have the Medicare Part B. So as soon as they get in the building, I usually, my, I, my corporate office 
is a whole department that that's all they deal with mm -hmm. is for insurance verification. Oh, that must be a fun job. Oh yeah, I'm sure they have a good time. I'm just glad I don't have to do it. Yes, yeah. um, so I send it to them at our corporate office. They send me back telling me exactly what's covered. I then reach out to the either the resident themselves mm -hmm. or if they have a power of attorney, I call them and say, hey, this is what we think they might need. This is what's covered. And then they let me know. And most of the time in this building, we've been very fortunate. Most of our folks here have awesome insurance. So they don't really have to worry too often about a copay or anything like that. But even when they do, it doesn't, it does, has not been too much of a hindrance. We mm -hmm. have some folks that it's a struggle. But um, for the most part in this building, they have pretty good insurance. Mm -hmm. So it gets covered under Medicare Part B and then whatever secondary they have. Okay. And I think we even have some folks that say i want a little extra i like yeah. what i'm getting it's a big help it's benefiting me i want even more than my insurance would pay so they can certainly do that right yeah. they can have what's called private pay and um that's based on the medicare scale as well they set the price of what they consider our services to mm -hmm. be and so um, yeah private pay is absolutely if we've gotten to a point where medicare part b or the secondary is no longer going to cover the the cost then we can certainly look at that mm -hmm. Now, tell me, if a resident ever needs equipment, and sometimes they do, it could be short term or longer term, like a cane or a wheelchair or a walker, uh, can your therapy department get involved and help make recommendations or help them get it fitted so they get the right one? Yeah, so we can make recommendations. We don't usually hand out equipment um, under outpatient. We just say, hey, this walker may work. We have ones that we can try and we can say, okay, we've had success with this, so before you go out and spend a lot of money, we, you know, we can say, we're pretty sure this is what's going to work. Um, so we absolutely can make recommendations. We can help with wheelchairs. Um, the one, it's just unfortunate that the one downfall in this setting is it's not usually covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. We can certainly try to submit to insurance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll cover some of it, but by the time it gets done, usually most people just, I'm just gonna go out and buy it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I've had uh, folks, family members ask me, uh, my mom's making the plans to move in. She doesn't have a piece of equipment. I want to make sure she's set, even though she's not needing it in the moment. And uh, they want to just go online and get something from Amazon.com. And I said, well, why don't you wait? Let's see how well mom or dad is doing. Yeah. And then if the need presents, get some recommendations. Because what you don't want to do is uh, pick up the $5 walker at the garage sale, right? right? And which is sometimes, it, you know, if you have something that, say, Aunt Sally mm -hmm. had in the basement, mm -hmm. And it's just a sim simple forward, you know, wheeled walker. Sometimes that's going to work, but ch wheelchairs can be a little bit different. You want that a little bit more personalized. So uh, that would be usually my standard: is why don't we get them in? Let's see what they need before mm -hmm. we start putting a lot of money or effort into something they may not need, mm -hmm. or buying something that may not be appropriate or worse, maybe unsafe mm -hmm. for them. Absolutely. So, well, we're all different sizes, and so yeah. sometimes when I see the little. Uh, a petite lady who's probably 80, 85 pounds, and she's got, I, we had one that had a bariatric wheelchair for people over 300 pounds, yep. but she couldn't even push the wheels easily. Of yeah. course, she doesn't have the body strength. So just as we're all different sizes, our needs are different, we have to make sure our needs are being addressed the correct way. And especially with the walkers, those are, you know, we adjust those with specific things in mind, like the bend of the elbow, the, you know, the height to the wrist ratio, that sort of stuff. So we don't, it's not just, just moving it up a no, notch. Okay, no, I really, bet everybody thinks yeah, that's what they do. Look at a lot of different things. We look at it from different angles. Wheelchairs are the same thing. It's okay. like, especially if that's something where they're going to get to the point where that's going to be their main right mode of transportation. We want to make sure it's comfortable, that there isn't things rubbing on their skin, mm -hmm. that you know the seat isn't falling off in the back, which could happen if it's something that's been sitting in a basement or mm -hmm. attic for a while. And we don't often think about it equipment really being prescribed, but I wouldn't go to a garage sale and buy a pair of uh, eyeglasses that someone had five years ago when I would have a different prescription. So yeah. we've got to think the same way about some of our other medical equipment. Exactly. Will. Yes. So here at the Lantern, we also have the Jive programs at all of our community. And uh, how, how does Jive actually integrate them with therapy goals that someone may have? So Jive is, a, once again, it's an occupational therapy dream come true because hopefully once they're done with therapy, some of the stuff like hemispheric exercises, uh, maintaining in, as much independence and safety as possible while completing their daily activities is gonna be carried over through that JIVE program. So 
we have the jive in itself, which is the 10, 15 morning exercise that Amy does every day or LaRonda. So that really carries out some of the, like I said, the hemispheric exercises that really helps stimulate cognitive function. And it also, you know, stimulates active range of motion. But jive also includes, like I'll give Amy a program saying, okay, this person can brush their teeth in standing. All you have to do is put the toothpaste on the toothbrush and stand there with them. And that helps sometimes People are like, well, it's just quicker if I do it for them. Mm -hmm. And it, from our standpoint, from therapy standpoint, the jive standpoint, the more that they can do for themselves, it keeps them as functional as possible, mm -hmm. and they feel good. Once mm -hmm. again, it's that better living through an occupation. Yes, and it's a principle of just learning in general. Mm -hmm. I'm sure for parents uh, teaching youngsters about anything, it's easier for the parent to do it, but we teach them so you know they will have those skills going forward. And the same thing, you know, I think with. Uh, uh, teachers in general, they're teaching us so that we're learning something yep. that we can do independently. Yeah, because we really are a case of use it or lose it. And if we're doing things like always putting their shoes on for them or putting their socks on or you know, getting them dressed instead of allowing them to do what they can safely, they're going to lose that ability. And once they start to lose that ability, then other things start to deteriorate too. So mm -hmm. that stimulation to the brain is what Jive is all about, is keeping us as functional as possible. Mm -hmm. And that also means giving us the quality of life that we all deserve. Exactly. And that's why we come to the Lantern of Shrimp Valley versus other facilities is because we're focused on them, you know, them doing for themselves mm -hmm. and Absolutely. enabling them to take care of themselves. Well, so tonight we've learned about rehab services and gotten a little bit more information to help us realize the differences between physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and how that integration of all of them can connect to the goals that someone may have to get them stronger to that higher level of functioning and then also coordinate with what's being done in other departments like nursing or even dietary with the dietitians and nutrition you know it's, it's a full circle if you will a full complement of programs and, and services uh, that bring that quality of life to the residents here so don I'm, I'm sure we've only just touched on our topic tonight but would i be able to invite you to come back absolutely all right well yeah, thank you of thank you I want to thank all of you for tuning in tonight to Carolyn's Caregiving Connection. Remember, this program is live every Thursday at 7 p.m. It is recorded, so you can catch it another time. We certainly appreciate if you would share it on your own Facebook, uh, perhaps send the link to friends and family. It is also going to be uh, shared on YouTube, so now you can catch us uh, on every channel there is just about. We're trying to conquer the world here at the Land of Sugar and Valley with our new program. For those of you who might have a question on anything we've spoken about tonight or in any of our past programs, I invite you to call me. And again, I'm Carolyn. You can call me at 440-557-1104. That's my direct number. Or you're going to be able to see right on our website direct links that let you ask a question. You can make a comment on the Facebook posts. You'll find us without any problem. I also want to give you a little update for those of you who are following our participation in the longest day fundraiser last week for the Alzheimer's Association. It was an online virtual auction. So for a week, we had a number of different items that people were able to bid on. And our goal for the week was $750. And thankfully, because we have a very generous group of people involved, we raised over $1,200. And that's a lot for a community to, to raise. So to all those families and friends and even residents who helped donate some items to us and all those that were bidders, we certainly can't thank you enough. We actually had one person who uh, won a number of items and she didn't really want all those items. She bid to help the cause and she donated those items to the second bidder as a gift. So to me, that was such a kind gesture. And especially in this time of our uh, issues in the world around us, to see that generosity and that kindness, I thought it was very, very powerful. And I was appreciative. So I look forward to our next uh, edition of Carolyn's Caregiving Connection next week at 7 p.m. And until then, I send you my best for today and always. Mm -hmm.